So we're going to be coming out of, for those of you that have your Bibles, which I pray everybody does, uh, even if it's in electronic form, that's fine. Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Now, what's going to be a little different today that you all are probably not used to, I'm going to ask for your participation. I need your help to preach today. No, you don't have to have a three-point sermon. No, you don't have to come up here and preach, but I do need your help. That's why we needed a, a mic to kind of go around. I wanted to ask the question, and I want to get some feedback. I know in most churches when preachers ask questions, they're rhetorical. Not in our ministry. They're actual. So as we move forward. So Matthew 13, before we go into the scripture, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we come to you humbly. First of all, we're not even worthy to stand in the pulpit area to represent you. Our lives just are not that clean, Lord God, just not that pure, not that holy. But Father, you, with the Holy Spirit, make all the difference. Father, you make us able to take communion and fellowship because you have died for all of our sins and shortcomings. And then, Father, you make us able to use these feeble minds and these lips of clay, Lord God, to preach profound words that are far above our way of understanding or our understanding or our past finding out. But, Father, you use us, and we're so thankful. And, Father, I'm asking you to use us today. Go beyond study, preparation, schooling, life experience. And, Father, we have a, a, a visualization that we're grabbing and holding on to the hem of the garment where it's saturated with the anointing of God. So, Father, every person in here need, has a personal need for a word. Then we have a collective need as one family in Christ. All these blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Thank God and amen. One thing I'm excited about today, this morning is that because of the way that God brought us together this morning, he had to orchestrate some things a little differently than he normally does. We'll see each other in the hallway, and we'll forever be smiling at each other at this point. We, we will always be connected. We, I was a part of the move when God did an audible in our normal way of doing things, and he visited us, he filled us, and he was pleased with our service. We'll never forget that. So help me to participate in that. So we're going to be ministering today on the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, and we'll talk about a little bit later how that's not really very different. It's pretty much synonymous with each other. And so as we dive into the word, we want to start with a ministry test. And I need a mic. That's why I wanted a mic to go around. I would like to have, okay, okay, they, they have mics. Amen. I know that generally people that sing, they don't like to let people use their mics, but we need you all to share today. So if you can take the mic to somebody over here, I, I need to know, what, what do you know about the kingdom? of God. When you, when you hear the word kingdom, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? And then I need somebody to take a mic over here. I want, I want to hear about the kingdom from this side of the room as well. Mm -hmm. Amen. The kingdom. Amen. Somebody just raise your hand if you want the mic. Okay. There, there's my, my, my buddy. In the, we, we did ministry for years together. Amen. And she still loves me. Uh, okay. Somebody get her a better mic. All nations... Bye inclusive. Amen. Amen. All nations and inclusive. Okay. How, how about over here? Amen. When I hear about the kingdom, what do I think about? I got 10 minutes, right? <laughs> it's a kingdom ruled by a king. Yeah. Uh, and that king is God. Hallelujah. And through the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 We got another brother. Amen. Thank you for volunteering. I like how scripture says that it's a mustard seed or other super small things that become exponentially huge. Amen. Amen. That's, that's, that's awesome. Thank you. Anybody else? Do I wanna, oh, amen. We got a brother in the back. Amen. Thank you for volunteering. I know Mark don't let you all talk, but we're we, we going we, we, we gonna to break that cycle. Almighty. Amen. Almighty. Hallelujah. So would you all think that with the things that we just said, we, we, we talked about inclusiveness, we talked about what the kingdom of God is like, the exponentialness of the kingdom, we talked about the king, would you think that's a good subject for us as a 
ministry, Kingdom Ministry Storm Creek, to really preach about and to minister on because it kind of takes things to a different level. I think we've been aiming too low. Anybody agree with this? Well, what I mean by that is the aim is to blend two churches, to become one, to worship together as brothers and sisters, to, to, to bring the community into churches. I think that's an aim is too low. I think the, the greater aim is to bring people into a kingdom mindset. Now, we got to be careful with the word kingdom because in our culture, the kingdom has become a catchphrase. When people want to seem super spiritual, they just throw the word kingdom in front of it. Kingdom clothing, kingdom language, I had a kingdom meal. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about inclusiveness, being one. We want to kind of raise the bar. What does the king say? Uh, we, we went to, some of y'all don't know, we went to Unity Christian Reform, Reform out there in um, uh, Kentwood, Michigan last week, and uh, Pastor Wayne is Canadian, so he actually is very familiar with the monarchy and the king system, and he was saying, man, I was getting a little jealous, he said, because the last couple of weeks, all you all have been celebrating the king, and that, that, that's my king and queen. You all don't really have a king and queen. And it was a funny thing. But guess what? We do have a king. And as much respect as the king and queen gets on the, in the earth realm, our king should get that much greater honor and respect. Let's go to the scripture for a minute. So we, we've done our test. We know what's happening. So what is the kingdom of heaven? Romans 14, 17. I'm not going to go there. We're going to read some other scripture. I'm not going to have you turn it back and forth, so just kind of jot them down. Romans 14, 17. It says this. I have the scripture written here. It says, the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink. I kind of added a few things, not in sacraments or rituals, but in righteousness, peace, joy, and here is the, here, 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 here's the, there's a, the strong finish, in the Holy Spirit. So in this kingdom, you cannot survive, you cannot thrive without being imparted and empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's, that's a prerequisite. There are some things when you go to England to, to, to see the king or to see the palace or to be involved in some of the festivities, there are some prerequisites. But in this kingdom, the prerequisite is first and all that you must believe that there is a king and he is risen. If you don't start there, if you're vacillating there, it's hard to really walk in kingdom principles because you don't believe that the king as he's even risen. Nobody takes energy or, 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 or excitement in a dead king. Our king is risen. So I looked at the internet, and they gave a, a pretty good definition. I, I don't use the internet for, for, for preaching, but I thought this was pretty good. It says, the kingdom of God, also known as the kingdom of heaven by Christians. I love that they realized it wasn't just everybody. It says, the spiritual realm over which God reigns as king. Would you all say that's a pretty good internet definition? I think that's a pretty good internet definition. Because I don't know if they even knew what they meant when they wrote it, but I just believe that God sometimes jumps in and, and he uses people that are normally not usable. Now, we said this before, the kingdom of God is not a concept or a catchphrase. It is a biblical truth. It's the actual, actually related and predicated on having and serving a actual living king. I can't emphasize that enough. Because you use the word kingdom does not mean that you're in the kingdom. Here's a big question for today. Is the kingdom of God the same as the kingdom of heaven? And I want to kind of give you some, some Bible teaching methods today. You can tell if something is the same or very similar, if in the context of a few verses, the words are interchangeable. Anybody getting that? So Matthew 19, 23 to 24 talks about, and it shows us that the words kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God can be interchanged. You don't believe me when you get home, check, check it for yourself. Matthew 19, 23 to 24. So I'm in Matthew. Let me just kind of read it right quick. So somebody says, I, I'm, it's a holiday. I don't want to go home and read scripture. It says here, 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, Surely I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. This is the same conversation, same passage of verses. He's using both because they're really one and the same thing. So I just kind of stopped a lot of debates after service about, well, I'm from the kingdom of God. I don't know, I'm from the kingdom of heaven. I'm from the kingdom of... No, they're the same thing. We're, we're one family. Because guess what? The tying point is that they're only one king. Heaven just kind of gives us a whole bunch, a little bit of something else. I'm going to teach it a little bit later. So as we move on, uh, uh, there's, a, there's another bonus question here. The other bonus question is, why all of a sudden this secret code language. God's been preaching on the seashores. He's been preaching walking down the road. He's been preaching while he's feeding. Why all of a sudden, this is the first time we are introduced to this concept known as parables. Well, how many football fans we have? Anybody watch the NFL in here? Amen. I want to see at least one female hand. Can I get one? one? Okay, all right. I said, all right, we'll work on that later. That Ladies, that's a key to a good marriage. Start watching a little football. And one other key, don't talk about the uniforms and the colors and stuff. Let's talk about the, the game. Or act like you're interested. So as we look at it, the parables is a great situation because it reminds, the reason why I mentioned the NFL, they are so secretive in the NFL in calling plays. It's not just we're speaking in language that nobody else knows. No, we got the the sheets up in front of us. We got coats over our head. You know, we, 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 we hide underneath the bench giving plays. Because what was happening was the enemy was reading lips, which is the other team. They hired people that specialized in reading lips so they could know what the play was. Well, I want to tell you that we have a king that our enemy, Satan, cannot read his lips. You can speak the word of God. You don't have to cover your mouth. You don't have to hide your head. You don't have to hide your hand. You can speak the word with confidence and boldness, and the enemy cannot change the play. There is no perfect defense for this king. So as we go on, so when you begin to talk in parables, uh, the definition of a parable is a true life story relatable to the audience. Now, that's important. I have to say that because if I gave you some... That's one thing about preaching in, in multicultural settings, which I love. I have to make sure that the illustrations and examples that I give are applicable to everybody that's here. They can't just be so culturally biased that the rest, that nobody, this, hey, I got it, hey, man, we, we experienced that last week when we were in um, Unity. Uh, we were singing a song that we brought down, you know, and, 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 and they were singing with us, and, and I, I could barely hear them behind me, but when, we got, when they sung the song that they knew, it was like stereo. I could hear every word. Every I said, okay, we, 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 we've hit pay dirt. They, this is their song now. Isn't that, wouldn't that be wonderful if no matter what song God puts, we, we had that same energy and excitement? I don't care if it's their song, our song, because guess what? It's his song. It's his story. It's his song. It says, designed to teach a specific spiritual truth, usually pertaining to the king the kingdom of God, or the people of the kingdom of God. So God began to teach us in this passage why he used parables. And he didn't even mention uh, why he really used them. I, I kind of understood why. He, he just kind of explained uh, the purpose of parables. It says, then the disciples came and said to him, I'm in verse 10 of 13 of Matthew, why do you speak in to them in parables? This is not the outside people asking that. This is the inner group. Why all of a sudden, these parables, we, we, we never talked like this before. Watch, watch what he said. He said, and he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is kind of a play on words. The kingdom of heaven truths are not a secret. But they are a mystery to those that do not belong to the kingdom. Just like on the day of Pentecost, when they walked in and they were speaking in each other's language, it, it, it wasn't a mystery to the people that understood their language being spoken. 
It was only a mystery to those that were not privy to the language spoken. Everybody in here should know kingdom language because it's Bible. So he says, it's not a mystery to you all. Now, here's a question that they don't talk about. Why all of a sudden did he switch to parables? It doesn't say that, but in my study, what I understand is, is that Jesus had some things that had to happen within a certain time frame. He couldn't be taken to the cross before time to go to the cross. He couldn't do ministry in certain areas before it was time for that ministry to be done in those areas. His time is, is, is impeccable. And so the parables, and, and even in some of the teaching and some of the healing parables, he couldn't turn his whole ministry into feeding the poor. Because that's why he made a statement, the poor you will always have with you, because you, you're going to always be serving the poor. But don't let the totality of ministry hang on just serving poor. Don't let the totality of ministry hang on just being about healing people. Those are parts of the ministry mission, not the totality. So as we look at it, he says here that I want to kind of just run through these parables. I'm going to do it in like five minutes. Because the parables, I want, if we were down the, down the hall here, this would be the time of uh, sermon homework, we call it. And if we were down the hall, I would assign... The homework is, for homework, can you read these parables on your own time and then listen, pray and listen to what God is saying? Because remember, parables are applicable to those that are reading them. I know most of us in here are not really big on camels and eye of the camel. I thought that was talking about a real camel going through a, a gate. That, that's not what that's talking about. So read the parables when you get time and see what they say and how can you apply it even today's time. Let me just kind of run through them. Uh, so verse uh, one, and t- 1 through 9, the sore and the soil, I kind of renamed it as kingdom sores, sow good seed. I'm going to say that real fast again. Kingdom sores, sow good seed without worrying about or becoming distracted by the soil or becoming distracted by the soul of the people they're speaking to or, or, or being distracted by the heart condition of those that be, 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 they're teaching to, nor by the results of the sowing. What am I saying? God just said for you to sow. The, I love that, that, that passage. The first thing it said is the sower went out to sow. Why would he put something so menial in here? Everybody knows that, right? No, everybody don't know that. There are some people in church that are sowing no seed. When's the last time you not invited somebody to church? When's the last time you led somebody to Christ? I'm just being honest. I'm not picking at you, but when's the last time you had a conversation on your job? I know about the rules and regulations and all the different, but when is the last time somebody questioned your faith because they were curious and you, 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 you didn't really want to sow? So the next one goes on, and, 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 and there's a cross-reference. So, so the next one goes on here. It says that uh, verse 10 through 17 talks about the mysteries of parables. We talked about that already. Uh, verses 24 through 30 talks about the wheat and the weeds. I kind of renamed this son of man and salvation. You can really get the essence of this scripture by going to 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and 8. You don't have to do it now. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and 8. In, in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 8, I just want to give you a synopsis. It says, kingdom planting, kingdom watering, and we leave the rest up to God to give the increase. So what am I saying? Just keep planting, just keep watering, God will keep giving increase. Next one, mustard seed and uh, kingdom values, kingdom secrets and relationships, humble, humble small beginnings, Beginnings produce great harvest when sold in the earth realm. 
You don't have to sow it in the kingdom of heaven, sow seed in the earth realm. It talked about mustard seed. Uh, Pastor Wayne preached yesterday on mustard seed, and I love at the end of that passage I never focused on, it said a small mustard seed grows up to become a big mustard tree, and guess what? Birds and, and, and different animals inhabit that place. In other words, other people have a place to live because you sow. So when you sow kingdom seed, regardless of how much scripture you know or how much scripture you don't know or how long you've been in the faith, it produces a full harvest. And others come under that harvest and they, they get shade, they get rest, they get a, a security because you sow. 33 says leaven. That was my scripture from last week. And it bothers me that only a little leaven sown in the earth realm would affect the entire earth. I want to ask you a question today, and don't get offended by it. Are we leavening the earth? Are, are, are we making an impact? It just seems like the earth is kind of getting worse and worse to me, further and further away from God to me. But we know that some of this is the, the, the natural progression of sin, but is some of it, we're not permeating the earth. It said the woman snuck the leaven into the flour and she permeated it. She mixed it in. Are we not mixing the love of God with the hate of the world? There's a lot of hate going on. There's a lot of anger. Shouldn't the, the, the love of, and the joy of God overshower some of that hate? Let me go ahead and get done. I know I'm not getting invited back, so I'm just going to go ahead and finish. <laughs> Verse 44 through 46, the hidden treasure and the priceless pearl. The treasures, the kingdom treasures are hidden to those that do not belong, belong to the king of kings. Believers realize that treasures and pearls are priceless and worth selling and giving everything you have to obtain. Is there anybody in here that God asks you to give everything? There's nobody in here that God asks to give everything. He just said, if you can just give me something to work with, I can do a lot with a little. Just give me something to work with. So this one kind of upset me that I believe that we don't understand how precious it is. And, you know, I think people don't come to church anymore like they used to because church folk are not excited about the precious pearl of Christ. How do you talk about your church to your, your, your coworkers? How do you talk to people that are not in church about church? Yeah, well, you know, we got to go there and we'll be, we'll be out by 9.30 or 10 o'clock, you know. You, you know, because that's the first thing unbelievers ask. Hey, how long y'all going to be there? They never ask that for other events, though. Hey, Amen. when's the barbecue over? They don't ask that question. That's curtain in the football game. When's it going to be over? But we, we, we don't have that same excitement. Anybody remember when you first got saved in here? You used to tell everybody about Jesus. People see you coming, it's like, oh, God, he come again, here she comes. They're going to talk about Christ again. What happened to that excitement? Have we become too entangled? I think the scripture said we become too entangled with the affairs of this world to stay on course, to stay on mission for God. Is this a concept or is this a biblical truth? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all of these other things will be added. He goes into the other things. Are we reversing the order? God, when I get the right family, after I get my education, you know, we need a summer home. After we've done all that, if there's anything left, you can have it. I mean, you all know that God doesn't do leftovers. The treasures in the kingdom of heaven are better and more valuable, don't, don't shout me down, than shopping on Amazon. Anybody seen an influx of Amazon trucks lately? The danger about Amazon trucks now, you can't even hear them coming up on you because now they're electric. They're everywhere. Imagine if somehow... That same enthusiasm and incitement for God would be everywhere. 
let me close with this last parable. This is the one that really, really upset me because I believe that this is where we're missing it at. It's called the parable of the net or the dragnet. And it comes in in verse 47 through 50. I'm going to actually even read that one right quickly. 47. All right, here we go. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish. Here's a part that I think we missed it at. Of every kind. How many of us have becoming very selective in our fishing? I'll fish with people that I know. I'll fish with people that look like me. I'll fish with people that are not challenging. I don't want to get dirty. I don't want to get tired. But he said they fished for every kind. We're missing it there. Every kind means every ethnicity, every culture, even the tough, rough cultures. Some of y'all know I, I, I teach uh, solar, uh, electrically solar at CETA. And what we are doing is we're taking people that were not productive in society at times, uh, not, not most of our class. Our class are all people that are just looking to better themselves. But some of the other solar programs, they're more so like reentry programs. So people coming out of incarceration or some other kind of uh, a, a deficit and nobody will hire them, nobody will take a chance with them. Uh, what we're doing is, uh, when what they're doing, because our students are just kind of better in their lives and, 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 and for in their lives, they're taking people that might have at some point been a detriment to society. Because you know what happens, right? You know the pattern. I, 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 I go and I, I do my time. I come out and I can't get hired. Uh, nobody will trust me. Nobody will give me a chance. I have that stigma on my life for the rest of my life. So I really feel I have no choice but to go back to doing what I was doing. But imagine putting a skilled trade in their hands. And watch that the person next to you, now I'm not afraid of them, but I'm calling you, hey, man, look, I got this solar issue. Can you come up? Oh, electrician, oh, man, my power's out. Can you? So it's taking them and giving them value. I'm so glad to be a part of bettering people's lives. So similar to the wheat and the weeds, our mission in the earth realm as believers is to sow good seed to all people. How many of you all, when you go, how many plant people we have in here? We, we got any garden people in here? Any plant people? Amen. Amen. My brother back there, he said, nope. But, but, but he eats all the stuff that comes out of there, though. But no, I'm not doing no gardening. Because cause Pastor, Pastor Wayne said, okay, well, how many people in here actually garden and you like gardening? <laughs> because there's, there's a difference with, with gardening because gardening is a lot of work. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time for it to produce a harvest. So you got to like it even if though it doesn't, you can't see what's happening because what's happening, this is a spiritual concept, is underneath the ground first. You'll get that on the way home. So as we looked at it, so notice that he doesn't talk about, so when you go to get seeds, um, do you take the package and shake it and, man, how many seeds in here? Or hold it up to the light, man, these don't like this. These seeds are kind of small and these are kind of chunky here. You don't do that. And you don't have to do that in the kingdom. The seed that we, he wants us to sow, guess what? It's good seed. This is the best seed that you can get. Don't worry about is it the soil because the soil is going to vary. Because the soil is related to the heart condition. But the seed doesn't vary. It's good no matter. Matter of fact, there's a, there's a miracle that God does. He can take good seed, plant it in bad ground, and receive a good full harvest. Anybody here can be a good, a, a good plant person or a good horticulturist or whatever it is that you want to do, a good gardener. You can do it because the seed is the best seed out there. As we close, John 21, 3 through 19 says, teaches us the importance 
of sharing, spreading the gospel because we don't, we do our, we don't, we don't do our part, then it doesn't really happen. We need to be influencers and effectors of the world. We do the spreading, and he does the sorting. That scripture was John 21, 3 through 19. The problem here is that we so busy in the body of Christ trying to figure out, and we use this illustration when we stand before the pearly gates. I'm not sure where that came from. That God is going to ask us about other people's salvation. I think we're missing it. He's not going to ask you, even the ones that's closest to you. There's not going to be a conversation about Thorn Creek, Kingdom Ministries, your spouse, your children. He's going to ask you, what did you do with and for my son? And I think that in this parable, in the parable with the wheat and the weeds, God does the sorting. Stop trying to figure out who's going to make it in the kingdom. We used to have this statement in my mind, man, I, oh, I know she ain't going to be there. Oh, I know he ain't going to be there. Be careful with that. Because we don't know the extent of God's mercy. That's telling me that you think that you got it all together and, and other people don't have it all together. Be careful with that. So what should we do? Sow seeds everywhere. Sow seeds to everybody. Sow seeds in every soil. And don't worry about the end result. He will bring the end result. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you all for being so patient and so kind and so prayerful. But if we were down the hall, this would be the part where, I know this is not really allowable in most churches, where we talk about, is there anything that you heard in the word that has been special to your heart? And you don't have to do it today, you know, but you, you can do it in, as, as we dismiss and in the hallway and to your family on the way home. Man, you know, I didn't like the whole sermon, but I did like this part. This part was speaking. Now, this is the part that you're not going to say. I think on this part, God was speaking to me. But that requires me to do some inward soul searching. That requires me to do some looking in the mirror. As the book of James says, don't forget what you saw that quickly when you turn around. Remember what you looked in the mirror and you saw. So all of us have been challenged this morning. There's a parable that's got your name on it. There's a parable that's speaking to not just to you, but to somebody on your job. So when we say in kingdom ministry, the word of God is never finished until you've eaten it for yourself and had enough to share with somebody else. Amen? Amen. Anything else before we transition? Amen. Anything on your heart? All hearts clear? Amen. We're going to still hug in the hallway? Amen. Amen. Well, if you don't hug me, I'm hugging you. Amen. I'm just so thankful for the relationship so you all know that kingdom is. It seemed like the relationship hasn't been as fast as we wanted and some things, but you know what? Sometimes good things take time to develop. And I believe that Thorn Creek is worth the effort. I know kingdom ministry is worth the effort. So let's continue to be an example. And what you all don't know is that everybody in South Holland is watching us. The mayor asks me all the time, how's that combination? How, how? He don't know what to call it. How's that thing going between Thorn Creek and, 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 and kingdom ministry? He always asks about that. So imagine having a mayor that's concerned about what we're doing over here. Because they know this is an unusual thing for people to come together as one. Forget about different cultures and different ethnicities. We, we, we're not even the same denomination, but God can knock down all that. Because why? We're all kingdom people.